Hi guys, it's Ross Hodinot for NatureTTL.com and this is my guide to the essential filters for landscape photography. So first things first, we need to decide what type of filter we're going to use to take our photograph. There are two types available. There are circular filters that attach directly to your lens and there are also slotting filters that work with a system like this. The advantage of a system is that you can combine corrective and creative filters together and it's certainly the, the, the system that I prefer. There are a number of brands that produce this kind of system including Kokin, Nissi and Hitec but personally I favour Lee filters and they're renowned for their quality and a lot of leading landscape photographers tend to go for Lee. In order to attach the filter system uh, to my camera, I need to attach a, an adapter ring first. And this adapter ring is a wide angle adapter ring, which means it's recessed further on the lens. And the reason for that is it reduces the risk of vignetting. Once the adapter ring is attached, then I can just pop the filter holder on. And it's as simple as that. It just snaps on and off really quickly. And now I can start to consider my composition and look to frame my shot. I've got my shot all framed up and the water motion looks fantastic in front of me. It's quite high now, the water is swirling around, it looks really nice. Um, I'm going to take a picture now, I'm just going to take a, a, just a quick test shot basically. The shutter speed is a thirtieth of a second. The water is quite messy and really what I want to do now is prolong the exposure to get a bit of motion for, for creative effect. And the way I'm going to do that is use a, a neutral density filter or an ND filter um, and that will allow me to artificially lengthen exposure. They come in different strengths um, from one stop up to 15 stops. A stop is a, a doubling or a halving of an exposure value. And this filter here is a three stop version. So what it's going to do is, is just lengthen exposure by three stops and that should start to, to create some motion in my image. So I'm going to pop this in now into the filter holder, take another picture and see what that looks like. The exposure is now three times longer, so it's gone from a thirtieth of a second to a fifteenth to an eighth to a quarter of a second. And I'm just going to take a, another shot now. And I'm looking at the review, and although the exposure is longer, it's really not long enough to make any great difference to the look of the water in this shot. So what I'm going to do is actually take that three-stop filter out and replace it with a more extreme version. I'm going to go with a six-stop filter to see if that creates the effect I want. This is a six stop ND, which Lee filters call their little stopper. And you'll probably notice on this one, it's got a foam gasket, which is designed to just seal the light when you put it into the filter holder to avoid any kind of light leakage. So I'm just gonna pop this in now. I'm gonna put it into the very closest slot to ensure that it does seal the light. At the minute, I'm looking at live view and my camera can see through this filter and the, through the lens meter and will just adjust naturally. And the exposure time now has lengthened to a couple of seconds, which should give me a much better effect in the water. And hopefully now I'm gonna to start to see kind of a nice swirly pattern and effect on, on the water. And the effect of the filter is gonna be much more obvious and much more creative. So I'm gonna take a picture and see how it looks. To get a more extreme effect, I'm going to go for an even stronger ND filter now. This is a 10 stop filter, which Lee filters call their big stopper, and this is going to absorb 10 stops of light. So it really is creating a very big shift in exposure between my unfiltered exposure and the one I'm going to take now. Now this is where it gets slightly more complicated. With this density of filter, my through the lens meter and my camera will really struggle to meter for the scene correctly. So what I need to do is look at my unfiltered exposure, which if you remember was a thirtieth of a second, and then apply 10 stops worth of exposure onto that. Now in order to do that, I'm going to actually use an app. Um, there's a number of apps that will allow you to calculate exposure, but I'm going to use the Lee Filters one. So, so first of all, I'm just going to pop this into the, the filter system. Again, making sure it goes into the closest slot to seal the light. And now I'm just going to have a look at the app. And I'm going to dial in the unfiltered exposure time of a 30th. And that tells me that with this filter, 
I need to expose for 30 seconds. And in order to do that, I'm now going to take it out of aperture priority, put it into manual. I'm going to keep my ISO and aperture exactly the same as before, but just dial in an exposure length of 30 seconds. And having done that, hopefully my exposure should be pretty much spot on. So fingers crossed. Fantastic, look at that. Something to be aware of when you take photographs using extreme NDs is that quite a few brands have some type of colour cast. Often it can be a little bit blue on the cold side or some brands it's quite warm. Don't worry about this too much, you can often correct it in camera by changing your white balance, but most photographers will simply just adjust their white balance in post-processing to neutralise that colour cast. There are some instances where actually the colour cast can look quite attractive, you know, when an image looks a bit cooler or a bit warmer. So don't necessarily correct it, just use your own discretion and process your shots on a shot by shot basis. Long exposures are great fun and the effect can be very, very seductive, but it is very important to remember that it won't enhance every shot. So don't just use these filters for every scene, it's very important that you use them appropriately. Having said that, I really feel that the shot has been vastly improved by the length of exposure here. It's transformed what is a fairly ordinary snap into really quite a nice kind of creative, interesting image. And I'm quite happy now, I'm going to pack up and head somewhere else for the sunset. Well, sunset is disappointing, as you can probably see behind me, it's a bit grey and a bit bland. But even so, there's lots here to photograph, tons of action, and I'm still going to need filters to make this shot as interesting as possible. Now, looking at the tide coming in, again I'm going to use an ND filter to blur the water motion, but the other thing I'm going to use here is an ND grad, just to make sure the sky doesn't actually overexpose. So, this is a, a graduated ND filter, and as you can hopefully see, it's half coated and half clear. And the idea with a graduated filter is it allows us to control contrast between brighter skies and darker foregrounds. Contrast is one of the biggest issues landscape photographers face. Typically skies are lighter than the foreground and in a lot of situations without filtration, the sky will either overexpose or the foreground will be underexposed. And these filters are the only in-camera solution to deal with that contrast. Like solid ND filters, graduated filters come in a variety of different densities, typically one, two and three stop versions. They also come with different feathered edge transitions. Typically they come in either soft, medium or hard transitions. And as you can hopefully see from these two filters, basically what it means is the transition from dark to clear is either harder or softer. Now the reason for that is different landscapes have different types of horizons. Typically for a scene like this behind me, and most coastal images, your horizon is relatively straight and even. And so a hard transition filter is perfect for that. But in certain landscapes where the horizon is broken or uneven, a soft grad is much better. And the reason for that is you do not want to pull the graduated zone down over key parts of the landscape. Because if you do, it's going to darken it and look artificial. And so a soft grad is a much better filter in those instances because the transition just basically feathers in to the landscape. The big question is, which density filter do you choose for different situations? How do you actually decide whether you're going to go for one, two or three stop filter? Well, the technical way of doing that would be to take a metre reading from the sky, which is typically lighter than the foreground, and then also a metre reading from the foreground and compare those two readings. So just to give you an example, if the metre reading from the sky was 500th of a second and the one from the foreground was a 30th, you would calculate the difference. Now remember, a stop is a doubling or a halving of an exposure value. So let's do the calculation together. From a 30th to a 60th is one stop, 225th is two, 250th is three, and to 500th is four stops. So in that example, there's a four stop difference. You don't want to even out the light completely though. So instead of applying say a three and a one stop filter together, you're much better to leave around a two stop difference between the foreground and the sky and that will produce a much more natural result. Now in this instance, as you can see, the sky is quite grey and the contrast isn't very great at all. And possibly in this instance, I don't necessarily need a grad at all. But actually the sky is looking a little bit light and washed out without a filter. 
and I'm going to use a two-stop filter just to darken the sky slightly, bring out some of that lovely texture in the sky and make the shot look a bit more dramatic. So you might be wondering why I favour using filters rather than taking a number of different exposures and blending them together to deal with a level of contrast. Well quite simply it's a matter of time. As a professional photographer I really spend a lot of time in front of a screen and I want to try and minimise the amount of time I have to process my shots and filters allow me to create the results I want in camera and then the amount of time that I have to dedicate to processing them is minimised. Landscape photographers often make the mistake of using graduated filters for every scene, but it's only high contrast images that you actually require a graduated filter. And if you apply them incorrectly, you might find that your skies are either overgraduated and too dark, or your foregrounds are too light and bright, and that will look artificial. So before putting your filter in, actually have a look at your histogram. So whether you've got a live histogram on live view, or whether you have to take an image and then review the result, have a look at the shape of that histogram and if you see that there's actually a dip in the mid-tones so it's like a horseshoe effect that often it suggests that you either need to use a grad or that you need to use a stronger grad so use the histogram to help guide your use of filtration before I get swept away guys I'm going to say goodbye I hope you've really enjoyed this tutorial today and that you found it helpful don't forget to subscribe to Nature TTL and I look forward to seeing you again very soon subscribe for more and don't forget to check the description for links to all the gear used in this video.